Okay. So it's 2 p.m. at least in the time zone where I am. So um, thank you for joining me to my session about Teams lifecycle management with Microsoft 365 tools only. Um, a short introduction for to myself. Um, oh, sorry. So now it's working. So my name is Michael Plitner. I am a CEO and co-founder of a company named InterSuccess. Um, I'm doing a lot of Microsoft DSC stuff since a couple of years. Uh, started with OCS, Links, Cap for Business, and now Teams. So I have a lot of experience with uh, the tools in Office 365 and Microsoft in general. Uh, we are doing projects in small, uh, mid, and, and enterprise markets with a specific, a specific focus on digital transformation, using uh, teams in, um, in, a, in a better way as, as you currently use your on-premises tools. So that's uh, also the reason why I always have to talk about some challenges for uh, especially enterprise customers when you want to automate and um, work with some uh, automatic processes about lifecycle management because a huge and a company with a couple of thousand users um, has different challenges as a small company with three or five users. So that's um, pretty common for every company. So I try to explain some, some generic uh, ideas behind that. And I will explain and talk about some stuff about life cycle, what, what perspective for life cycle is important to consider, what's uh, important to understand from the tool perspective, which tools are available and um, also a small recommendation from my side about the tools uh, available and which one is the best to use. So when we start with a uh, life cycle and we take a look what uh, life cycle management stands for, basically it's, um, it's, a, it's a whole process, not only for the creation of a team or of a group, of a 365 group, which is a basic uh, behind every Microsoft Teams team. Um, it's also about um, handling from uh, an existing team. For example, if there are some, some users leaving the company, what happens with the owners? If there are owners in a, in a team, what happens to uh, the permissions in a team? But also if you talk about uh, the leaving process, um, if you have an enterprise, um, company, there you have a lot of um, cha people changing, so they are, uh, there's a switch between all the different um, all the different uh, users which are involved for a team. And um, when we talk about the whole life cycle, we also talk about um, the deletion or the the situation where a team comes obsolete. So that's um, definitely a put, uh, something you have to consider as well. What happens with the data in the background? Was, um, all, all the stuff um, you have to consider during a whole life cycle. And um, if there is a, a process about deletion or it's not in use anymore, um, what happens when you start um, with the deletion process and someone said, oh, oh hold on a minute, I, I think I need it anymore uh, still. So um, when we talk about life cycle, that's uh, the whole process. Think about this, think about the processes, but also think about the users. You heard it in the previous session, it's important to onboard and um, use user adoption to involve the users. Also think about the processes from, from the user perspective. So it should be easy for the user to handle, but it should also be easy and safe for the business or the IT department when we talk about lifecycle management. So there's no, um, it's not the best idea to, to use 
thousands of small steps uh, just to fulfill the existing process. Um, for the IT department, maybe you have to think about, can we automate something in the background? And that's um, very important to understand. Um, but what, why is it so hard to, to handle all this stuff? Um, yeah, the general idea is you have to something um, from, you have to think about the whole process. So in general, you talk about um, how can I create a team? That's pretty easy. There are some recommendations from Microsoft as well, how to handle that. Um, and that's, that's pretty easy. But uh, for the next step, what happens if we change something? What happens if uh, someone is leaving and he was the only owner in a team? So you have to think about the whole life cycle in your team, uh, in, in your uh, company or in the customer company if you're a consultant. So um, I think the hardest part about this is to understand it's not about a single point, but it's a whole life cycle you have to think about. And that's that's pretty hard for the most um, situations when you talk about life cycle. From my point of view, there are five areas where you have to uh, keep your focus on. And you have to think about from the life cycle, but also from the government's perspective. So life cycle is um, not a single part of the team's usage, but in the most cases, it's uh, combined with governance. So if you have governance co topics, um, it's usually combined with life cycle and life cycle is combined with governance. Because if you want to create a team, then you, have to think about what the do. Do I have some naming policies? Do I have some uh, policies about um, the length of the team, the description of a team? Um, do I have some um, some some governance for um, the owners, the ownership of the team? So that's something um, where you have to think about from the creation, but also from the from the deletion process. So if there is no user in a team anymore, no owner or just a single owner, it doesn't make sense to uh, remove the team. Shall I contact the user? That's something um, you have to think about from a lifecycle perspective. But what happens with the data in the background? So what happens with the information in the in the chat? What happens with a with a OneNote, which is maybe available in the team? So um, that's something you have to consider for the governance perspective as well. And I said OneNote. OneNote is just one example for the multi multiple uh, apps you can add to a team. And that makes it more complex for the life cycle and the governance perspective. Because if you add a team, um, an app to the team, you have to think about um, the data in this app. So if you add a planner, for example, and you um, made some decisions in the planner app, um, what happens with the decisions and you want to delete the team? Does it make sense to delete the team? Is it okay to delete the team and the planner in the background? Shall we keep the uh, planner in the background? Um, that's something you have to think about. Uh, what happens to third party applications? Um, do you want to allow every third party application like Dropbox or, um, yeah, Trello or something like that? Um, if you want to allow that, because uh, it may be a common tool in your in your company or in a cus customer company, then it makes sense to allow this. Um, but what happens with the data after that? Is it still accessible? Is there any connection between the team and the and the data? You have to think about for the creation for the um, permission level if you have an existing team, and of course for the deletion part. I've mentioned this before, you have to think about the owners and, and the user structure from your, uh, from your team's environment. So in a general case, um, it's recommended to add more than just 
one owner to a team. Um, and from my perspective and my experience, it makes sense to add those users all in a in a life cycle and a creation process already. Or if someone is leaving and it was one of two owners in a team, you have to request, start a request to the existing, the leaving, uh, the, the, the remaining owner, um, please name a second owner for a team. You always have the situation where someone is maybe ill, sick, on a sick leave, um, on, a, on a work travel or whatever, um, and those users are not available to handle maybe requests in a team. So if you have a backup, the, the other user can handle that. The same for the for the user itself. Which permissions do you want to add to those users? Does it make sense to allow create new um, new channels, delete channels, add some apps, something like that? Um, that's something you have to think about in a lifecycle perspective and in the whole process. Um, as mentioned before, the data. Um, and data in this case is about uh, the file in structure behind a team or in a team. You take a look into the data. Um, some users have some access about that. Um, some users created something. Um, you have 5,000 gigabyte or five gigabyte, like a less number, uh, of total data and just uh, one gigabyte is important for, for your decision making or for the results at the end. So what happens with all the, um, the data? Shall we back up all the data per, per se to make a, a full backup available? Or does it make sense to um, just reduce it to a specific file structure which should be extracted at the end of a team on a regular basis? Uh, what about the general backup uh, idea behind that? So that's something you have to think about uh, for the creation, but also for the existing um, teams handling. And last but not least, um, um, from, from my point of view, a very important part is uh, guests. So every guest or environment in your team has some permissions. Um, so you had a have a specific account in the background and guest account in the background and this account is maybe uh, linked to an another enterprise account so for example you are a cust uh, customer which is uh, who's working with uh, multiple vendors you start um, to work with a colleague and this colleague is brilliant he's very important for your project he's leaving the partner company but you want to continue with the, with the work with him. So he's you, uh, leaving the company, working for another company. You add this user with a new account as well. Um, and this happens a second time within the next months or years. And uh, so you have for the single user, three different guest accounts. So what uh, you have to think about what happens with those users. Um, the next part is, when you have some some accounts in the background and you want to handle that, um, is it allowed to add guests in every team? Does it make sense? We may have some some uh, teams where it's not important or not allowed to add guests. It's something you have to think about for a life cycle as well, because you can decide during the teams creation already. Does it make sense to block? Um, guests in this team. That's something you have to think about before you just drop the tool and allow some stuff, some handling with that. So um, Microsoft provides some tools for that. Um, I want to name some tools here. Um, regular tools is something which is pretty, pretty common, pretty easy to access to or get access to. Um, if you take a look into the Office 365 group management, you have some retention policies, some Teams templates you can use. Um, and if you want to pay some, some extra cash for Azure P1 um, license, then you get something like naming policies and group expiration. Naming policies are policies you can add with, uh, with a prefix to, to 
assign a prefix or a surface uh, um, um, prefix and the part behind the name. Sorry, I don't know the, the right English name correct at the moment. Um, you can specify that, but that's uh, very, very, um, yeah, that, that's, that's, that will affect all the teams. Uh, every new team will have the same prefix or suffix. That was the name. So um, if you have to, the request to add some sp uh, very specific in the middle or uh, at the second place, that's not working with this uh, naming policies uh, itself. The group exploration got a very, very huge improvement over the last couple of weeks or months, I think. Um, so in the first step, the group exploration was based on the creation date, which doesn't make sense because if you create a group on the very beginning of a team uh, of a project um, and then the, the team is in use, um, but the specified time frame is uh, obsolete. You get a request to renew the team. So Microsoft um, made some changes and is looking for the last activity in a team. So what was the last uh, file access? What was the last um, chat message? What was the last activity in the team to um, identify the expiration? It was very important and you get the first reminder um, 30 days before you want to, before the, uh, the group will be expire. Then a couple of days before at the moment uh, the uh, um, group is about to expire. And uh, after that you have a recovery time from uh, 30 or 90 days, depends on your settings. About guest access, um, it's a little bit complicated. You can get some tools from Microsoft, but you have to pay for Azure P2 in this case. Um, with Azure uh, Premium 2, you get the feature access reviews, which allows you to start requests um, to the owner, but also for the guests, do you still need access to the, um, to the team? or does, uh, do you still need access to this app? So this is um, a huge improvement, but it's uh, maybe a bit expensive. There are some workarounds for this, but those workarounds are pretty bad. So that's not a, something you can do on a very easy way. Um, if you have to work with a lot of guests, then maybe it makes sense to spend some money. You get some other features with Azure P2 as well, so it maybe makes sense to spend the money. Um, but um, you can create some Power Automate flow and Microsoft Graph API um, tools or workflows actually with um, with those tools. So what is um, the Graph API? I will explain it in a second. But um, Power Automate is something you maybe heard before with Flow. You can create uh, in, the, in the dependency of an action, uh, of a trigger uh, to start an action in this case. And um, with the Graph API, we can drop some direct commands and use some templates. Azure Automation um, is another option for that. Um, Azure Automation is something you can run in the cloud very uh, standalone. You can use it um, to create some runbooks where you have um, some steps, uh, some, some process steps uh, in, a, in a right order. You can use um, Azure Runbooks multiple times. You can use just a small part um, from the Azure Automation, but it's maybe different to handle that. It's uh, it looks very common to um, to a regular PowerShell, but uh, it has some other dependencies. Uh, where are the accounts uh, and the permissions coming from? What is the um, access in a cloud about that? Uh, do you want to use a cloud? Um, app or a regular account, want to save credentials in that, that's something you have to consider when you start with Azure Automation. It's nothing you can start uh, from scratch and just uh, easy, just uh, next, 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 finish. You have to um, 
you have to think about what kind of purpose you want to achieve or what, what situation you want to achieve. And um, but it's a very, very, very cool way to have a standalone uh, running automation process in uh, in your daily work. So that's the basic idea behind that. You can use accounts with username and password. You can create some uh, upload some certificates, which can be used to uh, for the authentication in, in very specific ways, and um, also use some secret keys created by Azure applications. Um, I've mentioned Flow before, and I would like to show you just uh, um, the direct integration with, with Flow. Um, when you take a look into Power Automate or Flow, um, about the um, available trigger and the available uh, actions behind behind Microsoft Teams, you see there are a couple of things. Also with um, create a channel, also with, um, with um, yeah, list some channels, handle some channels, but they are not the, there's not the, the full package of handling the process. So when you take a look into that, um, you will miss some some features like create a new team with some very um, unique names, um, add some features, maybe have some structure available. Um, but it's a good starting point. So if you want to create some, uh, or if you want to use some automation behind that, so maybe the trigger is um, someone is new in a team. You want to post a welcome message, or you want to share some links to the user, then you can use it. That's a good starting point, but not for the whole life cycle. That's the only thing I want to say. I've mentioned that before. I want to talk about Graph API because the Graph API is uh, basically the, the underlying uh, structure uh, under all the apps. And, and tools from Microsoft. So when you take a look into Office 365, every app and every um, tool is connected to the Graph API. The Graph API is a connection layer to uh, drop some information, drop some trigger, get information out of Office 365. And you also get some connections to enterprise mobility and security, so EMS. You can uh, handle that uh, with, with the Graph API way better as a, as a general program or PowerShell connection behind that um, for, the, for those tools. And last but not least, Windows 10 is also connected to, um, to the Graph API. So the Graph API is the best way to go for your um, for your request. Um, it's a quick overview of what's possible with the Graph API. Uh, as you remember from the previous circle, um, it's basically all about the, um, about the Graph, Graph API. So from the creation about member handling, team settings, app installation, tabs, everything, and then uh, archive or delete a team. So it's basically everything you, you're able to do. And um, there are some, um, some yeah, Graph API connection types. I'm not sure if it's the right way um, where you can handle that. So with the Graph API, you're able to handle teams, groups, channels, teams apps, teams apps, teams app installation. And you get some new things, um, the chat, the call, the, the schedule, all the stuff is in the preview right now, but um, it, it's, that means it's available, but maybe uh, if you are facing some issues, you may have to uh, reconsider um, that to a time later um, to use it. Okay. Um, as mentioned before, there are some templates 
especially for the huge sectors uh, where you can use Microsoft Teams for. Um, the first is uh, standard. It, commercial. There is no additional apps and properties in the standard and the default uh, template, but you can use in education uh, some stuff like uh, class or stuff, uh, teams in a retail, uh, something like a retail manager where you get some specific settings, some specific pre-configurations in your team, which allows you to uh, handle um, handle Microsoft Teams uh, in an automation process with a less configuration effort on your side. It's already pre-configured and you can use it to um, deploy and, and provision your uh, Teams way easier. Oh, and before I forget that, um, you can, of course, copy an existing team. So if the um, templates not fit for your uh, organization. So it maybe makes sense to create a, a team, which is a reference team for all the new teams you want to create. So there is a chance to, um, to create your team um, with your requirements at all the stuff you want and you need. Um, and then, um, yeah at those uh, tools you want to use it as a, as a reference for the new teams. What do you need when you want to use the API for uh, the creation? Basically, um, you need access to the Graph API. How do you get the access to the Graph API? Um, the best way is to use, or the only way is uh, to use an Azure, Azure AD application and grant permissions. So the application, um, the process, the Graph API uh, request should be able to get access to the groups, to users, if necessary, maybe to create uh, apps. You have to know the tenant ID, and if you want to use a template ID, uh, a, a template, then you need to know the ID. So um, those are currently in, in, in beta, um, uh, but this is an example for that. From, from my experience, it's, it's working pretty good for a beta. I would like to show you um, how it looks like when you start to create something. Uh, when you start to create this, um, with the Graph API. So the general idea is, I want to request a new team. So you, you see a couple of teams here um, and you want to create some new teams. There is a very easy interface for, for the user. Um, you see um, a, in this case, a forms um, document or a forms website um, where you can put in some stuff uh, which is requested from the IT. So in this case, I want to add the name, which is um, Team Spring Fast. Um, and I have to put in a description in this case. And um, also the IT is requesting um, to make a pre-selection of the classification. So there's a chance to add the classification, which is um, connected to unified labeling in the background, um, just in, in the form here in the front of the user. So you can add some, some descriptions here, um, make sure the users understand the um, way you handle that and what happens when they select. It's highly confidential, for example. Um, this is just an example. You can use forms, you can use uh, other tools. Um, the general idea is you get the information you have specified during the governance um, workshop, during the governance um, process. You 
add the um, requirements in this in this form or in this template in this um, in this user request you need as an IT to get the uh, environment secure. And in my case, there is a flow in the background. So I use the input from from this forms and do whatever I want to do in the background with that. So that's pretty straightforward, right? Um, but there is still no application in the background. So in this case, you have to uh, talk to an admin for your tenant, uh, or at least someone who has the permissions to create some, some apps in some environments, it's okay to create it on your own, but um, usually you need someone from IT about that. If you start about, uh, if you start with a, with a creation, it's pretty straightforward. Um, Spring Feast, um, you get the account types which are allowed to use this app. In my case, I just want to allow um, internal users to handle that or to get access to this app. And bam, here you are. But I mentioned permissions before, right? So I have to specify the permissions. In this case, um, at the permissions, I want to create some groups. So I take a look in the general availability in from the graph API about groups. I want to use it as an application in the background. No, no, no user is um, connected to that. And then there are a lot of different settings here. From BitLocker, calendars, groups, mail, teams. So as I mentioned before, it's the underlying layer for all the different products. So you have a wide range of different options here. In my case, I want to allow the creation of groups, um, maybe some more options. It depends on your settings. It depends on your request, actually. So let's say, okay, that's fine. And here comes the uh, admin permission into the in, into the situation. You have to add uh, you have to add uh, the consent from the admin about that. Yes, I want to allow all this for uh, those permissions for this app. That's fine. And last but not least, I have to identify how to get access to this app. In this, in, in my case, I want to create just a client secret. Um, it should not ex, uh, expire. Um, just a client secret. Um, just name it to identify what, what the purpose is about this. And then you have to copy this. And you have to cover this in this situation. You have to save it here um, because after that, um, it's gone. Oh, no, it's not. So um, maybe I was wrong. Let me double check here. Um, no, it's not. It's hidden. It's not gone. It's it's hidden um, in the in this case. And um, so if you haven't saved it before, you have to create a new one. Um, and then there's a, it's a good, good, um, how to from Microsoft, uh, where you can, um, use the templates, find the templates. In my case, I use the default standard template here. And, um, during the flow, during the um, this, this creation process, I use some uh, data I've got from the temp from the form here. Um, put it in some um, in some variables, then get the user information. Put it here. Uh, just I've just speci specified the. Um, the, the process. Um, I just specified 
all the usage of these variables for um, the handling of the channel of the, uh, or of the of the team in this case. I've added some uh, permissions over here um, in the advanced option field because um, it's you have to get the the tenant to address the right tenant that you don't have to uh, or it's not possible to use uh, the generic um, customer dot on Microsoft dot com uh, address you have to put in the the tenant. The audience is a graph API, so the idea is uh, to use a graph uh, URL. The client ID is uh, from another application, um, and then I have to choose between secret um, or certificate as the credentials. Uh, in this case, and I use the secret I've created in a previous run. So um, that's it, basically. Um, but this part here is all about the magic behind that. So there are some recommendations or some, some examples from Microsoft uh, available. Um, and the links to those examples are in the, at the end of the presentation. Um, you can take a look into that. Does it fit for my requirements? Does it make sense to maybe change something here? But the um, general point here is if you want to automate something in the background, you can use those examples, customize it for your environment and handle that for your needs, change it for your needs, use it as you would like to use it for your situation. So you can add some users, you can change some, uh, add some channels, delete some channels, something like that, um, add some applications. Um, and you also can have some, some, have the chance to get some trigger here. Like um, you get a report from all teams. And then um, if there are just a single owner in a team, then you drop an email, you're able to insert um, um, another process step here. If you have to approve um, from, from, uh, from IT to create a new team or change the team owner or whatever you want. So there's a wide range to um, add this. Um, in in this in this project and this pro uh, yeah in in this in this flow sorry okay so I want to come back to the presentation um, over here okay that's on my screen anyhow. Uh, let me put it here. Okay. Sorry for that. Okay. Um, the conclusion about that is um, you have a wide range of different options to handle life cycle. And there are some built in tools for uh, your specific needs. There are some built in tools to achieve your goals for the life cycle and maybe for the governance perspective. But there's not a single tool. There's not a single point to, to click on and say, hey, that's my idea behind that. Let's change it. Um, I want to allow every guest or deny access for the guests just by a single click. Um, this is uh, something you have to, you, you are able to use from an uh, IT perspective. PowerShell as a as a general um, access type from from a, a local client server, whatever. It's a graph API in the cloud, native cloud native, um, with some 
opt more options to use with the direct access to other products as well, um, and the Azure, Azure automation, which allows you to create some um, some perspective um, with standalone scripts, some um, Azure automation um, modular steps. So just uh, for example, something about the naming should be translated or, or changed in a specific way. Um, and the next step is to create a team itself. The next step could be the uh, you change the owners and you can reuse the owner, the change for the owner sh uh, shipment of a team uh, in another process as well. So you just have to reference it it's, instead of create a new whole process with all the, um, with all the um, with all the configuration and, and programmable style, uh, programmable part behind that. And um, the other point is um, you want to allow users to be able to create something. So you can use, for example, SharePoint for a specific list or for a specific um, list where you can add some teams. And if there's a new entry, you have, you want to start a, Azure automation step or um, um, if the user has run a specific task and triggered the right, right event, then you get the, uh, the input and want to create something new or maybe time-based overnight, whatever. And um, last but not least, the Power Apps, it's more complicated um, to program this. So I think it's uh, just for advanced users. But in an IT uh, company, it could be the best way to, to get access for the users as well. Um, my conclusion is, please use the right tools for you. Um, if you're an IT expert, it maybe makes sense to use PowerShell or uh, Graph API if you're uh, someone yeah, uh, who's able to uh, program something like that. Um, use Power Automate in the background if you want to um, create multiple small steps. Uh, you have some uh, idea behind all the changes in the in the um, in small steps, in small pieces, um, or you can use it in combination with uh, SharePoint side. So think about what your what your goal is and use the right tool for you as a as a IT, um, because a local PowerShell script does have other uh, requirements as a Graph API uh, connection. But if you are able to use it. Use Graph API. That's a way to go. Um, you will see the most uh, improvements in the Graph API. You will see the uh, biggest improvements in the Graph API um, over the next years. All the local stuff um, will disappear. So the recommendation is use a Graph API. I've mentioned it. There are some resources about that. Uh, what I have shown today. Um, take your time after the after that and uh, enjoy um, all the long reads about that later. Um, any questions? If you have some questions and not, are not, um, currently not willing to, to ask, you can connect uh, via LinkedIn or Twitter, check out, um, and, and raise a question afterwards. Um, last but not least, rate the session, um, join the, the late keynote with Kerana and Vesa um, later today. And yeah, Twitter, use the hashtag TeamsFist. Hope it was uh, valuable for you and see you next time. <laughs>